to it. From the top. Start now. Hello and welcome to this BBC News Facebook Live. I'm Helena Merriman and I'm the presenter of The Inquiry, which is a, a radio programme that goes out every week on BBC World Service Radio, where we take a look at some of the big issues of our time, terrorism, the environment, climate change, and often we're looking at where things have gone wrong. This week we've done something a little bit different, and it's what's brought us here to this square in Euston, in London, and we're going to meet someone who has an extraordinary story to tell. But before we introduce you to him, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the programme and how it came about. And it started with one of our eagle-eyed researchers, Phoebe, who is over there. Say hello, Phoebe. And Phoebe spotted a video uh, which was doing the rounds on social media. Some of you may have seen it. And the video was about how a city in Canada, a city called Medicine Hat, eradicated homelessness. And we were we were intrigued, we wondered how, how do you eradicate homelessness? And we looked into it and made a programme all about it, which is online, you can have a listen if you like. And it turned out they ended homelessness not through expensive treatment programmes or through unemployment programmes, but through something much more simple. They gave homeless people a home, somewhere to live. And that's what this Facebook Live is all about. So please, wherever you are watching all over the world, Send us in any questions, comments you have as you meet the man who's come here today who's going to tell us his story. So let's go and have a chat to him. His name is Wayne. Hello. There he is. Hi, Wayne. How are you? Hello, fine. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Wayne, you were on the streets for 30 years. What brought you to the streets? Um, that's, that's a difficult question. I can't give you one answer. Um, I have a very addictive nature. But I also think I was totally institutionalised as a kid. Air Force family. Boarding school, then joined the army. When I came out of the army, I was just lost. Just, I've always been used to being told what to do, when to do it. And how old were you when you ended up without, without somewhere to live? Um, 22. And I just, I, I've never really, I, it's funny, I, I know exactly what to do. It's, I don't know, it's hard to explain. I've been told in the last five years I've got um, post traumatic stress disorder. I wasn't diagnosed with that for 30 odd years. I'm a bit, a bit annoyed about that. But I, I've never been able to get myself together long enough anywhere to, to find housing, if it was or anything like that. So I fell into drugs, alcohol, and it got worse. What would you do then when you were, uh, I mean, this, is, this was near where you used to, to hang out on the streets. What would you do every day? In the end, um, to be honest, I, I lost any self-esteem, any dignity, and I, it got to a point where I used to get excited about shoplifting all day just to earn the money. Now, at first I was shoplifting to get my money for drugs and alcohol, but I'm not sure if that's the addiction. I'm not sure if that's the addiction, because now I think, even if I gave up, that becomes an addiction itself, just the buzz from stealing. It's, it's the only, life. you get to know one life and you get stuck in a row. And did you get offers of help? And if so, what were they? Yeah, I got brilliant offers of help from prison, about as useful as a pork pie in the cinema. I mean, no, seriously, I, there would be people coming to your cell offering you job training schemes and a job when you get out. So when you get off your cardboard in the morning, you can go to work. And it's just not realistic. You get, you get on college places, but they, every time I said I need housing, for 30 odd years, well, we don't deal with that, and you're not vulnerable. We've, someone's just got in touch, Dina, and she says, I've been there and it was terrifying. With great counselling, support and food banks, they will be safe and happy again. Bless them, charity starts at home. Did counselling and supporting food banks help? Um, they would have done. I, I've got to be honest, I, I, I really shot myself. I, I, I guess I've always had a very self-destructive nature. And as soon as people say, set conditions, I have to jump through hoops to get anything, I, I, will, I will just walk away. I didn't feel that I should have to after serving in the army. and I, I don't see why I should jump through hoops when I saw people around me in society didn't have to. So when did all of this change? Um, it nearly changed eight years ago or something like that. There was a, a cat team, no, not cat team, heart team, but they stopped the funding for that because it was obviously being successful. And then when I met Flick from SHP, because they have a policy of, you see, you, if I want to change my life, it is a matter, if you get off the street, stop the drugs, the alcohol, it's a matter of build a life. You don't start building the house from the ceiling down, from the roof down. You know, start, and you need a base, you need somewhere to live. Maria got in touch. She says he deserves a home. Everybody deserves a home. 
Amy says, I don't even understand how this is still a question. House, people need housing and those in need, and housing provides physical and emotional support. What, how, how did it come about that you were offered a home? What difference did that make? Um, well, they found me. I'm not really sure how it goes. Somebody got in contact with them. I didn't. I just, uh, well, let, let's introduce you now, since you're part of the story. Hello, I'm Lucy. I'm the deputy manager of the Fulfilling Lives Project in Islington and Camden, uh, which is a big lottery for the project. How did you first meet Wayne? Um, so, Wayne was referred to us by um, the outreach team in Camden. Um, Wayne had been known to Breast Open Services for many years. I don't even know how many. Um, and they'd found that the um, traditional offers that they were able to give to him, such as going into the homeless hostel, um, weren't working for Wayne either. He would rather not go into We've had one person ask a question that I imagine many of you are probably wondering. Chuck Walker says simply, how do you pay for it? Um, so we're really lucky, so our project is funded by the Big Lottery. They had um, some money which they decided to use on people with um, complex needs and there's 12 projects across uh, across England, um, which are similar to ours. Um, so that money was actually designated for um, that cohort of people that had the most complex needs in homelessness, substance misuse, mental health and offending. Um, so the charity that I work for, SHP, then applied to run the project with that funding and so yeah, that's where we get the money to, to do the work. So Wayne, there must have been a moment then when you were given that first set of keys. Tell that us was, what that was, that was like. That, that was, it was nice, but it was really scary too. I almost turned them down. I have to say, I've got this. Why, why scary? Because I, I was terrified. You see, for years, I, I've got, I've, I've set my heart on getting my own place before I can improve anything in my life. And once people start offering you that, you, 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 they're going to take the excuses away from you. And I wasn't sure if I was just making excuses in the end, or if this is really still what I wanted. Just tell us about that day, that morning when you opened the door to your new home. What did it feel like? This is going to sound weird to people listening. It felt more comfortable than prison, but you see, in prison, now this is weird, yeah. In prison, I never wanted jobs. I had the stability of my own bed, my own cellar, my own cabin. And I had, for a long time, I had a superior quality of life in prison than I did on the street. That's why you see the same faces in ones with well spread you know, year in, year out. And, and really, I just thought, well, I, there's a difference. I can go out the front door anytime I like. But otherwise, it felt, it's hard, it's hard. It was the starting point for me, but I've been eight months clean now from heroin and crack cocaine, which is the first time in 35 years. And what, was it eight months ago that you moved into that home? No, it's just over a year ago. But you don't stop heroin and crack cocaine overnight, it's very hard to do. And, and I did it on my own. I haven't been going to NA, AA, which I should. I, um, I didn't go to rehab. I did it, as I always said I could. I just needed that stability. It's amazing. You've got a lot of supportive messages, Wayne. Uh, uh, comment from... Uh, Danny saying it doesn't make sense to build homes for refugees, but not for our own native born. Uh, Samuel has said, I'm giving, currently giving shelter to a homeless person. They now have a full time job and their future is looking up. But previously, their zero hour contract put them on the street because they couldn't pay. Just a, another question about what it was like moving in to that first home. What were some of the things you could do there that you haven't done before? The, the new routines, the new way of living? It was just a matter of my dignity, really. But when I, you know, when you wake up, I mean, it's, it really is. I mean, I, I don't expect to be um, sort of girls coming after me. But even no matter what age you get to or what state you get to, when you wake up on a bit of cardboard, I've got all these professional women going to work and that every morning. It's lovely. It brings and it they look at you. Where well, they drop you off a cup of coffee and a couple of quid. But I, that, that's not the soldier I was. And I don't. I mean, I want their couple of quid, but I did. You want their you know, respect? Well, of course I do. But I wasn't. I was getting their money. Maybe they did respect me, I don't know, that's not how it feels. And, and the good thing is, is to wake up, because I don't know about you, I think we all wake up pretty rotten looking in the morning, if we're honest. <laughs> and it's nice to sort yourself out. Well, you wouldn't get out of bed, would you, United, just walk out into the street. You wouldn't dare. Well, you don't want to wake up on a bit of cardboard. 
I don't know, the wrong way to put it, or scratching your arse in the morning, whatever, you, whatever you're doing, you want to be able to sort yourself out and go out. Lift if you've just joined us, this is BBC News. We're, we're live on Facebook. I'm Helena Merriman with the Inquiry. And today we're looking at homelessness. And I'm here with Wayne, who's been on the streets for 30 years, and Lucy, whose charity helped find him a home. If you're watching, wherever you are, tell us where you are in the world and what homeless is like in the city that you live in. Or if you've been out on the streets, tell us what that experience was like for you. And if you've got any questions for Wayne and Lucy, do ask them. Mohammed from Pakistan has said hello. Mohammed, tell us what it was like. Uh, what homelessness is like in Pakistan. Um, we've now got eight and a half thousand of you watching, so get involved, send us a question and a comment. Uh, Lucy, is this something that you think is catching on in more towns and cities across uh, Britain and, and Europe doing this kind of uh, yeah, hopefully so. I think, you know, over the last few years in London there's been um, Housing First pilots coming up here and there. Um, certainly some of the other lottery funded projects across the country are using this approach as well. Um, and I think as we move towards getting more and more people into their own homes rather than into maybe hostels or in that revolving door cycle of being between hostels on the street, um, we're able to kind of demonstrate the outcomes and the benefits of doing this. And obviously stories like Wayne's and others like him, we can actually see that the approach works, so hopefully they'll be increasing um, funding to do more and more projects like this. Uh, so, someone called Cot has said, award hard-working people homes. And a few people have questioned, is it fair to give homes to people that they see as drug addicts or someone who doesn't deserve it? You must have had that, that question. No, I can answer you. that. I, I've always answered that truthfully. No, it's not. But the only you are you earlier asked about how much does it cost? Well, I've always been told by prison officers. I mean, the 48 prison sentences I did, and going in and out is expensive. It costs um, about 1,600 pounds a week for a prison. It costs 1,600 pound one 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 payment to get me into. You know, a, a rehab is £900 a week, and the prison, I've, I've spent 18 years behind the door, and let me tell you, contrary to popular belief, there are very few rapists and murderers in our prison system. They're shoplifters, drug addicts, and when you meet them on the wing and you've taken the drugs out of them, and, and the alcohol out of them, all I can say to the person who asked that question, and I mean this with sincerity, is that I would say to himself, there but for the grace of God go I. Because when I was a soldier wearing the Queen's uniform, I didn't imagine that I would be out. In fact, we're going to post a graphic now, so have a look in uh, below in the comments, which we discovered in the course of making this program, that uh, was looking at New York. And this was a graphic that was produced by Pathways to Housing, which was a charity that first came up with this policy 20 odd years ago. And they found that in New York, the average cost for one person in one night of a home that they were given was around $57. The average cost for one night in a shelter was $77. Once you compared that to jail, that was $200. And once that was compared to a night in A&E, that could be twelve over $1,000. So people say it saves money. Is that what you found? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and what I'd also say, I think um, the housing first approach that we use certainly is not taking up any kind of council stock um, that's available for vulnerable people. We're actually using just private rented sector market, um, which is, you know, an open market and anyone can, you know, go and get those flats. And that's actually the flats we're using to put people like Wayne in. Um, in terms of cost effectiveness, absolutely this approach, um, even for someone like Wayne over the course of the year, as he said, if he was in and out of prison or having to use um, hospital chaos to get his health needs addressed, that's a huge cost to the public purse, whereas if he's stable in his own home, registered with a GP, obviously he's not offending anymore, so there's not the cost of prison. It's actually saving um, the government a huge amount of money kind of housing in this way, giving them the support so they're not going to be bouncing around systems which are very ineffective both for their health and their well-being and also for the traffic service. We've had a question here from Richard, and please do tell us where you're writing from, because it's really interesting knowing where, where people are. But Richard says, and this is, I guess, about responsibility, says there are many reasons for people becoming homeless. However, indiscriminately dishing out homes to homeless people sends a very clear message that you don't have to take any responsibility for providing yourself with a home because the state would give you one. Does it? Do you think it's irresponsible? I, 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 agree, I actually agree with a lot of these people. There's two points I want to quickly make, mm. OK? I don't know what he regards as responsibility, but I walked the streets of Northern Ireland with an SLR rifle, and I was only a boy by most people's terms. That's a lot of responsibility. But also, for years, if I was asked this question five years ago or more, 
I'd have bowed my head in shame and said, look, I've, you're right, mate, I've got this. I, I see your point. Because there are hard-working people without a criminal record who don't touch drugs, pay their taxes, and they're homeless at the moment. Only in the last five years, I have been told by my GP and other people, Wayne, you have a number of mental health issues. I didn't know that, and I still don't recognise it. But I'm being told I do. Now, if it's right that I am suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, which I wasn't told to recently, and I have mental health issues, then I am actually thinking I'm not feeling sorry for myself and I do deserve it. Because my, I still don't think I have, but I'm being told by medical people I have. Do, do you think you felt more responsible after you were given a home or, or less responsible? I've always... You know what, I'm going to be honest, and I think the surprise to most... No, I'm going to talk about me and other drug addicts might be able to relate. The way I'm treated as a drug addict, about 20 years ago, I stopped giving a shit, whether, no matter what people think. Because if I smoke 60 cigarettes a day and get cancer, the country will have mercy. Oh my God, he's, the poor man's got cancer. If I drink two bottles of whiskey a day and get liver disease, oh, the poor bastard, he needs a liver. He's a, he needs a liver. When you have a drug addiction, which is a disease, everybody really just sinks you a piece of scum. And when you're sick and people look at you like that, to be honest, the last 10 years, I wouldn't have pissed on society if it was on fire. So he's probably right to think I don't deserve this. In many ways, I don't, but I'll take it. Yeah, if I could just add to that, I think it's not about indiscriminately giving all homeless people housing. The Housing First pilots and projects have started up as a result of um, the existing housing not working for people, you know, people going in and out of hostels, getting kicked out, ending up back on the street. Housing First, um, as an approach, came for the most entrenched homeless people, like Wayne, that have had years of homelessness, years of intervention, interventions not working for them, years of their health needs going unmet. As Wayne said, you know, he's only recently got a diagnosis, which he should have got. 30 years ago, which if he'd have had at that time, if he'd have had appropriate housing at that time, he may not have been in this position for so long. So Housing First is really about working with the people that have got the most complex needs and are in the most need that are on the streets and offering them an alternative. It's not kind of about offering everyone a home very easily. It's about really thinking about the highest needs and, and working with those kinds of people. We are, just to let you know, we can't post the graphic that I just mentioned while we're live, but we'll post it as soon as this discussion finishes. Keep your questions coming in and any comments you've got. There's a lot of support coming in for you saying congratulations for being clean Thank for nine months. But amazing. I just want to say though, I do, I do, I feel for the people who do think, you know, why should you get, especially, I mean, at the moment it's austerity. I do understand if you, if you haven't been a drug addict, I understand, but if you, I, I hope they haven't, but if they've lost somebody through cancer, a disease is a disease and it's very easy to have different perceptions about it. Yeah, can I just can I just jump in? So Robert has said, congratulations on being clean for eight months, Wayne. One day at a time. Good luck. And Elise has said, Wayne, you're a legend. So inspiring. Um, and so yeah. And so also just to add that Housing First is used in American model for just the 20% of homeless people that are on the streets for longer than a year who also have mental health problems or substance abuse problems. So it is, a, you know, a small portion of the homeless people. It's not giving homes to everybody and it only suits 20% of the homeless people that need it the most. S Sandy has also got in touch. She said, I've been homeless with my kids. It was mostly due to my undiagnosed bipolar disorder. Once I started meds for that, I was able to settle down. I'm in a small town of 10,000 people in South Dakota. Thank you for sending that in, Sandy. We've got some question from Mohanid, and I imagine this is a question that a lot of people might be asking around the world. And he asked, he says, I don't understand why people are homeless in a country like England. Well, <laughs> OK. It's going to be a boring answer, but it's no good looking at blaming what people like me who are getting help. The boring answer is we don't build houses, but there are landlords that can have 60, you know, with, with putting tenants in at a time. Most people have two homes. There must be at least a million homes that sit empty six months of the year in this country, and a lot of the homes built in London, they're, 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 they're being sold in Abu Dhabi before they go on sale here. Now, I know they're not, you know, the sort of homes that we can afford, but we're... we're, we're it's a bigger question now. You know, we're homeless, people are homeless because we, the family unit has broken down, communities have broken down, and I, I don't know how to answer that, but what, what I do know is we're not building enough houses and we're selling them all over, especially in London. You know, even, I mean, I know, I, a prison officer was talking to me last time I was in prison, a senior officer, and he's married to a sister who's a nurse, and they can't buy in London. There's two professional people. What about uh, shelters? Because a lot of people might say, well, why can't they just stay in shelters until they sort themselves out? What, what was your experience of shelters? I think they're fantastic, but they weren't for me. I, 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 
I'm not antisocial, but I, like I always have a single cell in prison, I can't, I find it very difficult to me. Somebody came, I haven't been diagnosed with bipolar, one of your uh, listeners earlier, was, but I've, I've always been diagnosed with depression and severe mood swings. When I lose it, I lose it. I'm either on the roof or on the floor. I'm quite calm, it's unusual. But um, I, I, I couldn't.